Hello, and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Dr. Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new Team Therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. His latest book, Feeling Great, contains powerful new techniques that make rapid recovery possible for many people struggling with depression and anxiety. Dr. Burns is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. (laughs) Hello, Rhonda. Hello, David. (laughs) And welcome to all of our listeners around the country and around the world and throughout the galaxy. This is the Feeling Good Podcast, episode 396. And we have three special guests. And today we're going to be talking about something we've actually never talked about before. You know, David, before before COVID, put on a four-day training intensive for people, for therapists to come and learn about Team CBT every August. And I know I went to... um, a lot of them. I went to my first one in 2013 and it changed my life for a lot of reasons. Maybe it's, it, I mean, I think part of the reason it, my life changed was because of one of our guests. And, um, you know, after COVID, you weren't able to put on an intensive, David, and you're going to, you and Jill Lovett, who's the training director at the Feeling Good Institute, are, are going to be putting on another intensive. And we wanted to take this time to talk about what it's like to do personal work at the intensive. So we have two really special guests who did personal work with you and Jill. Um, We have Karen Rodelli, who did personal work with you in 2013. And I want to thank you, Karen, because that experience, even just thinking about it, I get chills and get tears in my eyes, made me want to become a team therapist. And we also have Jackie Ong with us, who did personal work with Jill and David in the last intensive 2019. Let me say a little bit about them before we go on. So Karen Rodella is a recently retired licensed psychologist who was in private practice for over 30 years. She worked with children, adolescents, and adults, and she experienced immense satisfaction from a long career working with and facilitating change in people's lives. And after experiencing After unexpectedly losing her husband of 30 years, which occurred four Mm. years ago, Karen closed her practice and moved to Montana to be closer to her family. And she now spends her time volunteering and traveling around the world and savoring the simple pleasures in life. And Jacqueline Ong is a licensed clinical social worker. And being of different cultures... Jackie especially appreciates the opportunity to address the unique privilege that comes along when working with patients of color. And she is located in the San Francisco Bay Area. So welcome to Jill and to Karen and to Jackie. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having us, Rhonda. Pleasure to be here. David. The uh, just to kick it off, this is kind of a hidden uh, commercial for the summer intensive in case any of you therapists want to join us August 8th to 11th. And we'll put in the details later, but it's it's always been the highlight of the year. And for some reason, that summer intensive uh, magic happens and we'll have some some proof of it uh, for you uh, in today's podcast with two beautiful people whose lives were changed when they did the personal work at the intensive, and uh, it, it every every year it, it it's been pure pure magic. And then that personal work, which we'll do again this year, Jill and I will do another live demo with some volunteer. That magic seems to permeate through the whole intensive, and and so if you want to come, it's not only a, a hopefully a stellar training program, four days, like 12 hour days sometimes and more. Uh, it's it's exhausting, but it's, it's, it's life changing, but there is something incredibly special about it. And, and uh, we're bringing it back to life this year after five years. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't be more, more excited ab- about any, any upcoming event. And but, there's a, uh, there's a lot of experiential learning 
where that you're te- it's you know people aren't sitting around for 10 12 hours listening to you talk not not that that wouldn't be enjoyable but <laughs> your I'm going to do that today we're going to this is an extended <laughs> podcast and I'm going to actually I have a special feature called reading a page or two from the dictionary that <laughs> is going to be very lively <laughs> so people are learning from you and then they're practicing they're observe they're watching you um and one of the exciting things about the way you've organized this is that the very first day in the evening you've asked a volunteer from the audience to go through their own personal work with you and Jill. And so Karen and Jackie came to the intensives as therapists and then when you asked the the audience to volunteer for a volunteer to do personal work they both volunteered. And that's how they got to do personal work. So if you're coming to the August intensive, you could also be doing personal work with David and Jill. Um, and then yeah. on Saturday night, we're going to be doing personal work with everybody who wants it. Uh, so it'll be uh, you, you'll have a chance to to do your own personal work this this summer as well, one way or the other. Yeah. And what that means is that on Saturday night, you know, on, on Monday night, we kind of do this live demonstration and that really Thursday, you mean, right? Oh, sorry. The first night. That's what I, I should yeah. say. That The first night of the workshop after learning some, we do this live demonstration. And I think that really does serve to kind of move people and um, inspire people. And then you learn a lot in the remaining days of the workshop. And the the night of the third day of the workshop, you actually have a chance to go into your kind of breakout groups or your table groups if you're in person or breakout groups if you're live online. And, and one therapist volunteers to be kind of in the patient role and doing personal work. And the other therapists are really um, working really hard to apply kind of all the techniques and strategies that you've learned in the workshop so far. So it's very much, um, you know, healing, but at the same time, also, you know, practicing by doing right. Not, as you said, not just sitting and observing, but like really, really trying your hand at it and getting feedback and learning about what you're doing well and how you can improve. Um, so I think people really do leave on the the fourth day, um, inspired and having learned so much to actually go home and, and really transform your practice. And I think that's what we've, we've all experienced, you know, in learning from David. Well, let's, let's dive in here and talk about some of these, uh, beautiful and brilliant and magical ladies who have joined us and bring back memories from, uh, previous intensives and and you know what were the changes real and did they last and was it as as good as it seemed at the at the time because these have been some of the most transformative experiences of my life as well I can't believe it uh, the the things that happened why don't we start with with you uh, Jackie I know that you have a little bit of a time crunch here so let's make sure we get plenty of time for for you to tell your story uh, and. You tell it in any way you want. Thanks, David. Wow, it's been it's been about five years uh, since I was at the intensive with you, and now as I look back at uh, the miracle that happened, truly it was transformational for me. Uh, I frame it differently than the way I left, and I realized that you really got to the root of um, some self-defeating beliefs that I have about myself or had about myself. And that included perfectionism and perceived perfectionism. And um, they've been longstanding challenges for me. But I'll tell you, as a result of the work that we did, um, I put up, put behind me the upsetting event that we've, um, we've talked about and, um, you know, I wish I could share more like I did personally at the, the intensive and, um, but out of respect, I need to, uh, you know, to, uh, not disclose certain aspects of it, but I will definitely say to you that I'm deeply grateful to you for the transformative work that we've done. And I'm eager to share about the positive impacts it's had on my life. It's impacted my relationships. It's impacted um, me professionally. Uh, it's impacted uh, my whole lifestyle. Oh. Deeply grateful to you for this. 
what was it like to do personal work and talk about something so so intimate in a large group in 2013 i i would guess there were 300 people there and the same thing for Kieran. And here you are talking about something, you know, so painful. What what was that like? Yes, yes. Back in 2019, I will tell you, it was certainly 19, daunting. 2019, sorry. <laughs> it was certainly daunting to to think of even sharing um, about this trauma that I experienced. And at the same time, uh I had such confidence <laughs> in the in Dave, David, as well as the facilitators, um, Jill and Rhonda. Um, I would say that I was definitely nervous. In fact, one of my negative thoughts was that I was going to get up there and I was going, my mind was going to go blank and that I wouldn't be able to say anything that would be of any use. And as we worked through that, um, that negative thought, and we did the positive reframe, which is absolutely amazing to me. That's like one of the highlights of Team CBT. There are so many, but the positive reframe was really huge for me. As we worked through um, this negative thought and we challenged it, I realized that I could um, lean into trusting myself. And yes, maybe even if my mind did go blank, what I needed to say would be said somehow. And that there is be something useful that would come of it. And that it would, and I've learned since then that it has impacted other people's lives who have had similar situations to mine, right? And knowing that we don't have to be perfect all the time. In fact, that it's impossible to be perfect all the time. And I think that that's like the light went on for me. And um, it's been amazingly freeing for me to realize that I'm going to mess up sometimes. I'm human. Uh, but that doesn't make me any less valuable. It sounds like um, the, you know, there was, there was an element of personal work that was done around the trauma, of course, and that was super um, helpful to you and kind of curative and impactful. But in fact, the very act of um, talking about it in front of an audience also was kind of curative in a different way, right? In addressing that kind of perfectionism, maybe what we call perceived perfectionism, like which is that others will expect me to be perfect. That there was, um, and you're not the first person I've heard that from, but it's almost like the exposure, we, we say like the exposure that you get and um, we don't need like professional exposure, but exposure therapy, like facing your fear, right? That you get from doing this personal work um, with trusted colleagues, but in front of an audience actually is um, kind of, I don't know, um, what's the word like the experience or yeah, makes it, you know, multiplies the experience, right? Most definitely. Um, the exposure, I think that that was necessary for me to address the shame that I was feeling. And especially, you know, also, you reframed a few other things for me, too, and helped me to, you know, to combat other negative thoughts. But um, the shame was huge for something that I was not responsible for fully. And so the work that the three of you did um, was really helpful to me, especially the empathy part uh, that I received from the three of you as well as the audience mm. afterward, the therapists and professionals that were there really, I could tell that they heard what I said and they could also um, imagine what it would be like in my position and, um, you know, tell me, you know, not just words of encouragement, but just tell me truths um, that I could trust and that I could believe. The, uh, uh, the, the, well, I have a couple, several things to say. First, I, I think that this, uh, it sounds so simplistic to say it, but perfectionism, perceived perfectionism is so key and common. Jill and I did a, 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 a live work with someone in our group who was totally, uh, 
not sleeping at night, exhausted because she had two patients who uh, weren't responding, and she specializes in short-term treatment of anxiety. And she was beating the hell out of herself. And I just saw earlier today, uh, Jill, our follow-up video. I was uh, and seeing the joy in her face at at letting go of this need to be perfect, and and it's okay to be stuck with a couple of patients and to ask for help and. And and when you say it, it, it sounds so kind of trite, but it's really a miracle. It's the miracle of death and rebirth, the death of this self that, you know, has to be special and, and hiding our flaws and then o- opening up and, and, and finding that, you know, suddenly the world has, has been transformed. And And I was saying before we started the podcast that, you know, to me, it really is magic that that happens. And people think I'm kind of a, a bullshit artist or, you know, they, they it sounds like hype or something, but it, it's really magical transformation that occurs. And when when you're touched, other people are touched. And I was telling you earlier, Jackie, about an impact of your personal work, just showing your part that you're trying to hide from everybody and all the shame you felt. And there was someone in that in that workshop I won't say his his name, although he probably wouldn't care, but I didn't know he was there, and, and he was a venture capitalist. And uh, and apparently he was uh, totally blown away by watching you and, and the experience you went through. And then uh, about uh, a year ago, we were struggling to try to, we'd been working for three years on this Feeling Good app. Now we've renamed it the Feeling Great app, and uh, and Jeremy, was, who was, was uh, our, our CEO, was supposed to be raising money. And he was afraid to. And, and so we'd been going three or four uh, years, you know, just everybody working for free. And uh, we're trying to raise some money. And then I got an email f- from this fellow. And, and he said, oh, I was at your workshop in 2019. And I heard you're working on an app. And, you know, I... I'd love to talk to you more about it. And I get all these emails and I try to, you know, refer them off to, to, to somebody else. And I said, Oh, you, why don't here's contact Jeremy. Maybe you could talk to him, but it turned out, you know, and I didn't realize that he was a prominent venture capitalist. And he said he was so blown away by watching you in that workshop that, that he, he wanted to give us a $2 million to, to get to get started and it was it was it was like a miracle and then i was saying just today coincidentally with seeing you for the first time since then except for when you were coming to the group which was great that he's giving us another uh, tremendous fa- financial pl- pledge and and so kind of the, the the impact of what you did is you know m- maybe uh, going to e- eventually end up uh, touching uh, hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people, if, if we can make that app successful. And, um, you, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be very inexpensive for people. And anyone who can't afford it, we're just going to give it to them for free. And we want to just keep making the, the magic happen. But, but what you did, Jackie, had, had a, a, just in that one person who, who, was, who was watching, he, he was totally moved and, and blown away. Mm-hmm. That's that's remarkable, David, just to hear how um, this person witnessing, you know, the miracle that is Team CBT <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, was so moved to contribute, you know, toward the app and also um, just was really present to, to seeing that um, this is an effective form of therapy. And he got to see it live, you know, yeah. since we've um, since actually being at the intensive and sharing my story. Uh, I've gone on to repeat, repeat the team CBT process with my own clients and, um, and with a few clients who uh, had similar trauma to mine. And I, I specialize in uh, one of my specialties that you know, I, doesn't happen often is actually um, helping people who experience religious, religious trauma. Uh, and um I think one of is the, religious trauma trauma inflict, inflicted by a religious person. 
a religious person or trauma experienced in a religious community, it can be a lot of different, um, it can be defined in a lot of different ways and it can, it's related to, it can be related to all religions. Um, And um, one of the best, let's see, what is it? The evaluation of treatment. I always attach it to the BMS. Yeah, evaluation of therapy therapy session. Yes, PTS now, yes. (laughs) The evaluation of the therapy session. One of their most remarkable um, pieces of feedback that I received after working with a client for a few weeks was um, their enlightenment regarding uh, perfectionism. And they said that um, they understood, you know, that we are all flawed. And um, that understanding that was very helpful for them to be able to move forward. And um, apparently there's this thing that I say quite often as we're moving through it. And that's that, that we are all flawed. So you can be you and God, whoever your God is, can be God, right? So we don't need to worry about trying to be perfect. We can just accept who we are as human beings and let go of the perfectionism or the perceived perfectionism. Yeah, yeah. And, and then when people hear that, they say, oh, there's just a bunch of wor- words there, and they don't understand that there's a Grand Canyon but behind them. It, it, it's something, in, you know, to live it and to experience it is is it's just mind-blowing. I yes, also because love... I was... Oh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to add, yes, because I was quite stuck in several areas of my life. Um before um, going through this, the treatment that I received at the intensive with, with the three of you. What were you going to say, Jill? Oh, I was going to say that you mentioned perceived perfectionism and, and worrying that others also essentially expect you to be perfect, which is extremely common too. And something that I, I know, um, I, I believe you experienced, and I know I've seen at other intensives too, is Sometimes, you know, when you're watching someone do this incredible live work and you're in the audience, you're so touched by it, you're so moved by it. And so sometimes we will um, do a survey or ask people in the audience, you know, tell after Jackie's done this personal work and she's worried that you're judging her or looking down on her, you know, to come up and take the microphone and, and tell Jackie, you know, how you're feeling about her. And and this is so cool um, because it turns out that everyone says, oh, my goodness, you know, I, I adore you. I'm so impressed by you. I, I I feel so close to you. You know, I'm so glad you shared this. It makes me feel, you know, more human and, and less worried about my own flaws. And so there's this whole myth that we all have that, um, well, I think. I think David and I have have both for sure embraced uh, embraced being kind of mediocre and being okay about it. But I think most people <laughs> struggle with this idea that it's really important to be impressive and to come across as having all your shit together, so to speak. And um, that what people really want is to meet someone who just totally has it together and so impressive. But it turns out, you know, that what we really want is just to hang out with someone that's relatable and flawed just like we are right that you're not really wanting to talk to someone who has it all together and is um so perfect but actually it's kind of comforting to see that other people are flawed and make mistakes and um and are willing to be open and and vulnerable so i just thought that was kind of cool too i imagine that's what you've been learning along the way too jackie so absolutely true jill absolutely true um it's affected my relationships, you know, inside and outside the therapy room. I'm so much more um, open and communicative, you know, about my life experience and just being frank about where I'm at, right? Because ex- people experience high highs and low lows in this life. Mm-hmm. And normalizing that in our regular, our daily relationships can be really helpful uh, to our friends and our family and our community, right? Because that's just what life is. One of the, uh, we're talking a lot about acceptance, although it isn't all just acceptance, but that's certainly an important dimension. And, and it's, it all, and it happens in my experience through, through paradox, because we're trying to become special. You know, we have this special self that we're trying to be, and we keep beating up on our real self and putting ourselves down because we're not good enough. And because we're screwed up in this way and that way. And, and and 
And we, we just think we have to become special to find that magic of love and joy. And then it turns out that when you just accept your your mediocre, flawed self, which is so frightening, uh, and then that's when suddenly the world opens up and the heavens open up and you find that thing that, that you thought you had to be special to get, that, that joy or finding abundance. I don't, I'm just babbling. I can't find exactly the words for it, but it's... Uh, um it it, it but we we fight against the very thing that that brings us to enlightenment um, so true you know because i kept you know other negative thoughts were um i should have known better this shouldn't have happened to me all of these different things and right am i supposed to know everything in the world yeah, <laughs> am i supposed right. to be the wisest being i don't think i'd be you know little old jacqueline and the San Francisco Bay Area, if that were the case, if ever that yeah, perfect. Sh- right? Shoulds, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have a class on that in the, uh, the your PhD in shoulds, one of the app classes I, I created. And uh, yeah, but it's like, how do you bring that experience to people so it's not just a head trip, just some intellectual thing? And, uh, uh, and shut up, David. Okay. <laughs> and people talk about real resilience all the time now, right? You know, how can you become resilient? Well, <laughs> what I will say is just having a deeper knowledge of cognitive distortions and having experienced treatment in this way, specifically Team CBT, really did increase my resilience, right? Um, it's made me stronger. It's a lesson. What I learned by just examining this this one event has been transferable to so many other events. I'll even tell you about the perfectionist piece in preparing for this podcast, right? I started to get, you know, because it does, you know, there's a relapse from time to time, right? Um, we aren't going to sure. try to push against oh, yeah. it and get rid of yeah. it, right? That can just make it bigger. Oh, yeah, so, right. So I started noticing that that was coming on the scene, Right. I've got to be perfect or I've got to be perceived as perfect. And I caught it earlier. And that's the beautiful thing too, is when you know that when you're cured of this, that um, when it comes back, if it comes back, you recognize it sooner and then it comes back again. And even sooner you recognize it. It's pretty amazing in that sense. And so I was just able to, to notice that and say, okay, that's happening. But here's the way we've reframed it in the past. Here's, here are the positive thoughts that I know for certain um, I want to put my weight down on. This is what's you, important to me. Do you think this is a lifelong learning thing, kind of like a spiral that goes up and you keep coming around to the same place, but at a higher, higher level, mm-hmm. and that the universe is trying to t- teach us this thing over and over and over again? Yes, yes, I do agree with that. And I do believe that, you know, we all have our little favorite cognitive distortions that we lean toward. (laughs) And um, through the work that we did, I definitely was able to recognize mine. And, you know, with some feedback from people that have known me for quite some time, you know, I understand that it was obvious to other people in my life. Maybe I just didn't know it. (laughs) So, yes, we do revisit that. I love the um, image, David, you know, of this kind of lifelong learning and sort of cycle um, that we keep revisiting because um, on the one hand, when we do personal work with therapists um, at the intensive or in workshops or training groups or things like that, um, or even on your podcasts, um, people can feel so much better and get such a tremendous amount of relief over the course of one really short session, two hour session, two and a half hour session. And then on the other hand, people, listeners probably go, wait, I don't understand. Like, how is it that you're just completely cured in in two hours? And then they sometimes even come to therapists and feel very, you know, sort of understandably demanding and like, get me better in two hours. And then I'm never, ever supposed to struggle again. And 
I think we all know that that's not at all the case that we can learn. And I, I think it might be nice even to hear that from Jackie and from Karen, um, but that we there's so much learning and growth and enlightenment and change that can happen over the course of two hours, but we're always going to fall back into certain patterns or ways of thinking under stress or um you know, interpersonal difficulties or things like that, right? But it's the idea that then you go back and you use those same tools. And I kind of like how Jackie said, you know, each time you visit it, maybe you catch it faster, right? Maybe you're able to rebound quicker. Um, but maybe you could speak to that. I don't know, Jackie, if you've had that experience. And and when, when Karen shares with us, maybe she's had that experience too, of kind of revisiting it, but how, the learning is there. Most certainly. You know, I will say that, you know, after the intensive, I was like, okay, great. I'm set. I've handled this. And, um, I did handle it. Right. We did, we did really see, you know, a true healing in that moment. Um, but that doesn't mean that the negative thoughts go away immediately or that we don't have failures too, you know, that bring us right back to those, those routine thoughts. Um, that are specialized in our to us <laughs> in our own minds, right? Um, but I would say that with some with some continued help from an excellent team CBT therapist, you know, I was able to realize that yes, this is going to happen. And um, but we have, you know, it's kind of like there are little breadcrumbs to get back to back on the path, right? And so the tools, the team CBT tools, have been really helpful to me you know, different methods, you know, um, externalization of voices and, you know, just, you know, the double standard, all these different things, um, especially the double standard that's helped me immensely in terms of increasing um, self-compassion toward myself, which in turn, if I'm employing self-compassion for myself, that makes me a more compassionate person to the people around me too, right? Yeah. <laughs> Since I'm experiencing it. So the yeah. double standard was very helpful in yeah. terms of, you know, being compassionate toward myself. And then again, just, you know, practicing um, yeah, what I had I, learned. That's, that's neat. I have a question for you. Um, and I know our time is so, so short, but th this kind of a stupid dorky question, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely anti-religious because my father was a minister and, you know, <laughs> more on that another day. But I, I do uh, am very open to and curious about what we would call sp spirit, the spiritual dimension of, of life. And I think that's what you ex experience, uh, both of, of you, uh, Karen and, and Jackie, in your personal work. And that, that's what happens at the end of personal work. It's really a kind of an enlightenment and and it's not like recovery it's it's enlightenment that we're going for and and enlightenment is is really the acceptance of your of your flawedness and and finding some something miraculous that happens when you do that but if i if i was to get very goofy and kind of ooh santa cruz uh, you know crystals weird stuff that uh, i i might say do you, would would you say jackie that would it be fair to say that God wants us to accept and all, and love ourselves as flawed? Most certainly, right? Uh -huh. You know, so many religions have um, this idea of somebody, you know, of, of God in, God being there to to um, save you and to um, do extraordinary things um, through you. Uh, but again, he he's there. He he might do that, but all, I think it's just really important to realize that um, we've been made to be flawed, or or we not that we've been made to be flawed, but that we are flawed, and God does His best work in those moments where um, <laughs> yeah, right, he yeah, step in and be yeah. you know that comes that to perfect. us in our in our suffering. Yeah, yeah, step yeah. in and be that. Perfect being. I will say that, you know, the um, healing and treatment that I experienced at the, the intensives um, is something that I don't think that I've, I know that I didn't experience um, in other communities that I invested in. And I find it remarkable. So many people are about like, 
oh, I'll never go to a therapist. Wrong. But this is like true healing that I experienced. Yeah. And you know. um, it doesn't matter, you know, the race, the creed, the religion yeah. um, that you are. It's what matters is that this there this type of therapy um really does bring about results um, that are healing and effective and and are and they're spiritual results that yes. might be a sick thing to say but that's the way it seems to me definitely freeing yeah. right and helping you to to be who you are rather than getting yeah. caught up with all the distortions that are sometimes created in our head or created yeah. by the world that we live in yeah. It, was, it was so uh, such a joy to see you, and such a, a treat to to see you, Jackie. And just you know, God God bless uh, for, for 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 sure from a from a, a true heathen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you for this. Uh, Everything yeah. in its paradox. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So. Uh, uh, any last words, Rhonda or Jill, before we move on to to the magnificent Karen? I know. Just really thank you so much for coming and sharing. And um, I'm really proud of Jill and David and the work that you did to, with them, Jackie. And to hear the the impact on your life, both personally and professionally, and how it's lasted. Yeah, it's been a blessing for me. It's been a blessing for all of us. I just feel like the community that we're in is just filled with so much kindness and love and and miracle. And then it's high technology at the same time because it's 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 systematic and it's it's a science and measurement based and all all of that kind of thing. But it's existing on two levels at the same time. Yes, I, I'm extremely grateful to to Jill and David and then the work that you did with me also, Rhonda. Um, it's just been uh, life-changing, and it's definitely improved the quality of my life. Um, and so impacted you. your patients, too, it sounds like, which is wonderful, too, right? The therapist yes. can heal themselves and then also bring that, you know, te technically bring the healing to others because we know the methods that we need, need to use, but also there's something about you know, practicing what you preach, right? And, um, and kind of knowing what it's like to, to heal yourself. Um, and you're probably that much more able to relate to your patients and help your patients. So most well, certainly, we'll, we'll have a million more questions for you, Jackie, but I know the time is short, and hopefully we'll get a chance to shoot the breeze some more, because it's just a joy seeing you. It was a joy working with with you. And, uh, I, you know, you, you have certainly, caused a miracle not only for yourself but for us and in some sense you know we're we're all one and when we bring a miracle to our patients we're bringing that miracle to ourselves yes most certainly i look forward to the next time we get to to okay. chat so should we ask karen the same questions that we asked jackie what was your experience like karen no, I think we should uh, extend we just, like, that awkward <laughs> silence for a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, Karen, uh, yeah. Tell us about your experience at the intensive, Karen, where hey, we hey. had the amazing opportunity of working with you. Okay. So and this was six years earlier uh, right. than working with, yeah. with Jackie. So this is really going back into the ancient history of intensive. Hey. Right, yeah. But I can remember that, Karen, like it was happened yesterday. Me yeah. too. Yeah, like it was yesterday. Yeah, when Rhonda contacted me, I didn't know whether to have PTSD <laughs> <laughs> because it kind of brought things back up again or oh, yeah. gave me a moment to kind of pause and reflect. And, you know, um, so I had a therapist friend who had been to one of David's intensives and she told me, if you ever go to one of his conferences, He's going to ask for a volunteer and you should volunteer. She goes, I volunteered and it was the best thing I've ever done in my whole life. And I was thinking, oh, I don't know how that could be the best thing you've ever done in your whole life. Like, OK, that sounds a little kind of far reaching, but OK, I'll keep that in mind. And so I uh, went to the intensive and 
David asked for a volunteer and I'm actually a very private person. So getting up on stage in front of, I don't even know how many people were there, maybe what, a thousand? I mean, there was a lot of it's easy how these things get magnified, I thought, but I think it was a I thought it was like 100, no way. or something. We no, were it, about it was, five extra people. No, it was really huge. I there were all huge. there. It was there were like at least twelve or thirteen or fourteen tables people? with ten tables with yeah, ten. That's what it was. That's per exactly each person. right. Yeah, yeah there was a lot of people. There were a lot of people. Yeah. But there were uh, uh, there were only uh, 135 people, but there were uh, 13,000 souls. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was a thousand people. It was amazing. Yeah. So something was just tugging at my heart, saying "volunteer, volunteer," and I was like fighting it. No, no. I mean, how could I get up there in front of my peers? And this is like so personal. And but I just made myself do it. I went up to David at the break and said, oh, I'll volunteer if you still need one, kind of secretly hoping he'd already had one. <laughs> and um, that that kind of started the whole thing, was just being willing to get up there. Yeah. Tell us what it, what it was like and remind us what, what you were working on. I, I right. can say it, but I, I wanna, yeah. want it to come out of your mouth, Karen. Right. Um, so it was terrifying going up there because, like I said, I'm a private person, so... I was afraid that, you know, people would judge me. People would think I was a bad therapist. And the reason I was up there just in short was um, when my daughter was 12, um, she went out to play with some friends in the neighborhood. And one of the boys had a pellet gun and shot her at close range in her face. And it was very um, traumatic. And um, she was traumatized and, you know, experienced all kinds of anxiety and depression and PTSD and which resulted in oh and and what happened is she her her front tooth got shot out which resulted in all kind of dentist appointments and and what have you and she's a sensitive person to start with so she really you know didn't respond well to this and so um before she went out to play that night um I just had this sense that I shouldn't let her go it was kind of it was dark it was cold it was like ah, I don't know but I wanted her to have fun. So I let her go. So when that happened, I blamed myself. And that started a whole, you know, kind of snowball effect of, you know, I'm a bad mom. Um, I'm a bad person. I caused this, this is my fault. And which resulted in me having a lot of, you know, anxiety and depression. And it, it I just felt like my life was over and I would never, ever, ever be happy again. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember you telling us as well. Um, and it's so weird how you remember things like they were yesterday, <laughs> but I remember you telling us as well that she went through a lot. I mean, you said dental surgeries, but maybe therapy and her own PTSD and right. It was like a really a kind of harrowing experience for her for a long time. And yeah. I just remember you being, you know, the most loving and, and caring mother and and sort of you connected being a good and caring mother with being a guilty mother I think right I mean as many of us do yeah. but you felt so guilty and so responsible and as you saw your daughter's suffering you know your suffering kind of increased right and it was at that time how much time had passed from the incident to when we worked with you nine years I bet mm -hmm. yeah yeah something yeah. like that again. So like this was like something that you had carried with you. And, and I remember you so tearful, right? I mean, it came up, it was still nine years later, so emotional for you, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, do, do you remember, uh, and we still have the video of, of that, although it was just, you know, Jeff Lazarus just had his camera in the audience, so it's not like mm. professional video or anything. Yeah. But I can remember you, well, a lot of the video shots that, you know, we still have. But I remember you at the beginning ju just sobbing mm -hmm. and, and saying, I'm I'm a bad mother and I, I, you know, it was my fault. I never should have let her go out and play something like that. Mm -hmm. And the emotion was just palpable and and, and intense. And 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 when you hear about another person's story you you discount it when 
you're saying that you were thinking these people in the audience are blaming you and judging you, but that was real. That that was as real to you as the fact is there was skin on your hand and uh, hands, and and you were in in as much agony as a human being can 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 experience. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and you'd been feeling that for 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 nine long years, and your daughter was suffering with you as as well and then that the hopelessness uh it it's just you know this depression and anxiety are just so cruel in and 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 making us believe these terrible things that aren't even true and to believe them with all of our hearts and to be suffering uh, and, and intensely because of these messages, self-critical messages that we're, we're we're giving ourselves, and and yes, you were so beautiful and courageous to get up there with with us in front of all of those people and con confront the monster that you feared the feared the most. Mm -hmm. uh, just you like you did, Jackie. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say maybe Karen can tell us then what you know how how did how did um how did it impact her right like what how did things unfold for her maybe during the intensive and then after how did it impact you when you left the workshop yeah i think um the most important things that happened during the workshop were some of the techniques that we did um one of the techniques i think that david used was the survey method and and that was to ask the audience what they thought of me and um, that was actually probably one of the coolest experiences of my life because people that I knew who were all therapists came up to the microphone. I think there was maybe, I don't know, five to eight people or something um, came up to the microphone and said what they thought of me. And I was just like blown away because it wasn't critical at all. It was very loving and kind and, and. Annie and, and Annie was yeah. one of them, remember? Uh, yeah. Yeah. In, in Maryland, coffee. Uh, yeah. And Ted, I can't, Vander or something. I can't remember. Uh, I'd have yeah. to watch the film again to see who all it was, but it was just Very amazing. Nice. It was absolutely, that actually, you know, really blew me away. And then the other techniques, of course, were like the double standard, just, you know, uh, hearing how, have yourself talking to a friend in a kind, loving manner, but yet you don't talk to yourself like that. That was really powerful. And then I think the externalization of voices of, is what blew it away, really just being able to challenge those, you know, negative thoughts that are just so, so damaging. I have a question for, for both of you, uh, although you haven't answered all of Jill's wonderful questions yet, but one thing I get busted on a lot, you know, is people are saying you can't change quickly. People, you know, this is like a kind of a fraud that you're perpetuating on people. And uh, and that change takes, uh, I've had therapists tell me change takes more than 10 years. And, even, and that would even be for little baby steps to get just, Start, started what, what do you think about that arg argument and particularly when someone's had trauma that then you're going to have to nurse them along for years very gently little by little but it helps if they jiggle I, the eyes a little yeah. bit along the way yeah i think the uh, thing that's so powerful are the team methods and that's what what's different about team than any other method that's out there is that you're challenged with your beliefs and that challenge doesn't let up because if one technique doesn't work, you go to the next one and the next one and the next one. So you really don't get a break um, in terms of being able to get away with continuing to believe your thoughts that are like killing you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know if I would have been a believer before I experienced it myself. I mean, you can kind of believe on some level, oh, yeah, that's got to work. That sounds powerful. That sounds wonderful. But having gone through it, yeah, I'm a true believer. It Change happened really fast. I mean, it might have been two or three hours, but still, that's not 10 years or five years or a year or three months. It was exactly two hours and 21 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, that was torture. <laughs> you know. Not 10. <laughs> you know, as an observer of both of you, I know, you know, 
not to make this about me, but I sobbed with both of you, you know, watching both of you do the work with David and Jill. It had a huge impact on me. I was just blown away by the depth of work that you could do in such a really short time. And at the time of the intensive with that you were doing it, Karen, my son was 12 years old. So Mm -hmm. I kept imagining my son in the same situation as your daughter and feeling so much compassion for you and for her and really gratitude that you shared the work that you did with us. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it, watching you and David and Jill go through that, that that's when I said, Oh, this is, I have to learn how to do this. I'm going to become a team therapist. I want this magic. Wow. How is your daughter now? She's good. She's really good. She's been married for about five years. She lives in Colorado. She is also a therapist Um, got licensed in two States and has a private practice. So kind of took after her mom. Uh Um, Yeah. She's, she's doing really good. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, One thing that I believe happened, but, uh, you know, I I don't always remember things correctly. Uh, But that I think you watched the video with your daughter Mm -hmm. after the intensive, which was another courageous thing to do. And I think you said she hadn't even realized that you had been depressed these nine years and, and, and blaming and blaming yourself and and it sounded to me like after you you watched that with her, then things began to change for her as well. Yeah, I think it was a real, I mean, I kind of debated whether to show her that or not, but I felt like it was, you know, a good thing, the right thing to do. And we watched it. And I think it, that changed our relationship and she got it. She understood how just kind of the burden I'd been carrying around about blaming myself that that happened to her. She didn't feel like it was my fault at all, which was super interesting to me. Right. Um, But I think it changed the course of our relationship and made us a lot closer. I have another, I have another dorky question for for you. uh, And I apologize, but I'm just so fascinated by uh, what, what, what you're talking about. I don't know. I, I I think you view yourself, Karen, as a religious person, but I'm not certain. Is is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so was. Would you say there was a spiritual dimension to to your healing, to what happened to you as as well? Is, was it purely a psychological recovery, or was it a, a deeper aspect? Uh, that's like such a complicated question because there's so many layers to that. But I would well. I would probably, if I was pushed to answer, I would probably say, no, it wasn't spiritual because I had tried the spiritual and I had tried and I tried to pray and. Oh, right. Yeah. I remember that. And and I, I don't feel, I hate to say it, but I don't feel like that was really working. So if I was really pushed to say, I mean, there's so many different ways of calling something spiritual. So if you're asking me, was it was team was that team experience religious? I would say no. Was but it when spiritual? we were reading the Bible together on stage? <laughs> didn't, that, didn't that give it a religious twist? <laughs> I mean, you could say it was spiritual, but not. I wouldn't say it was religious. Yeah, spiritual. Yeah, yeah. spiritual. Yeah. Was religious. No. Um. Something I was going to comment on is that something that I think was actually very much in common in both of your personal works um, is that you both experienced something that was incredibly traumatic um, and both had so much self-blame, right? And um, which, you know, from the outside, uh, as an outsider with both of you, it was so clear to see and to really feel that there was just zero blame that should have gone, you know, to either of you. But both of you were suffering tremendously because of um, self-blame, right? And and feelings of guilt and responsibility. And I should have done this or I could have done this and really kind of um, raking yourselves over the coals for it. And um and again, I think that's so common, right? Like I do think this, you you talked about perfectionism and perceived perfectionism, but just like guilt and shame, you know, even fo- following trauma, even when you're a victim of trauma, 
Um, and so, yeah, I just kind of wanted to, to mention that. And then to say, also, it seemed like for both of you, you were able to let go of that, right? Let go of the the feelings of guilt um, from the personal work that you did. And shame as well. And shame. Yeah. Well, and probably being a perfectionist sort of primes one for, you know, blaming themselves or feeling guilty. If someone had maybe a different type of personality and maybe perfectionism wasn't a part of their, you know, sort of the way they operate in the world, maybe, I don't know. I don't know if they'd have such strong feelings, you know, take responsibility for things that you're not really responsible for. Right. Well, like as Jackie said, the the positive reframing is so powerful there, right? Like what does it show about you that's beautiful and awesome that you feel guilt and shame, right? It shows yeah. that you have these really high standards that you're someone who's going to hold yourself accountable. You're not just going to go around blaming other people, um, you know, that you really care about those around you or care about certain morals and values. Jackie, mm-hmm. it looked like you were going to, were you going to say something too? Yes. Um, going back to, you know, the question about immediate healing, I, I did feel like there was immediate, you know, healing in that moment. And um, in fact, I think I even said that my body felt lighter. So like oh, yeah. physically, I felt a lot lighter. And um I would also say, though, that it's easy, you know, to forget. Oh, and yeah. As humans, we forget, right? Yeah. So it felt like immediate and instant um, healing. But, you know, I did forget, <laughs> you know, probably in the days or weeks afterward. But it was really um, helpful to have all of the, the 50 plus methods, right, that we could go back to. And also the way the two and three of you were equipped to be able to keep going forward, as Karen was saying, with one method after the other, after the other, something that I couldn't have failing, done. Failing as fast as you can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Until you hit the jackpot. Yeah. yeah. So having a skilled therapist or several skilled therapists who are saying, you know, one method after the other, when I might've given up on my own power, right. Working on myself. Mm-hmm. Oh, but yeah. I think that that was absolutely effective in terms of being at the intensive or working. See, I, I think the, the, the initial uh, total recovery, we let's call it that temporary, but total recovery is so crucial because that gives you both hope. You, you see, it is possible to change the way you feel. And plus there's a method, there's certain techniques that work for Jackie and other techniques that work for Karen and other techniques that work for Jill and other techniques that work for, for Rhonda and and for David and and so forth, um, um, I was going to say something else, just fantastic, and I have no idea now what it was. So you'll have to take it on faith. Hopefully, it'll come back. Hmm. But oh, I remember what it was. I remember uh, speaking of techniques uh, being important. It's not all smoke and mirrors and woo woo spiritual. It's a highly scientific, precise process that we're in- involved in. But I remember one of your uh, aha moments, uh, Karen. It had to do with uh, fortune telling, mm-hmm. and and uh, like that. You said there was fortune telling in your thought. I, I shouldn't have let her go out that night, but then you couldn't see what it was. And then you suddenly saw it. Do you remember that? Yeah. Was- yeah, it was. I was thinking of my aha moment was I felt like I should have known that she was going to get shot that night if I let her go out to play. Yeah. <laughs> There's no way I could have known. And when that light bulb went off, it just it just totally freed me. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that is so neat. That is so neat. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll let someone would, else talk. Well, and it was kind of like, you know, my friend Linda, who said, you know, if you get the chance to go up there, it'll be the best thing you ever did. Well, I can truly say it's the best thing, really, seriously, other than probably getting married to my husband it was the best thing I ever did because it freed me. It I'm freed so me. sorry you lost him. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, how many years ago now? Um, It's been four. Four. It's still pretty fresh. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is. 
but yeah, I feel like, um, well, kind of going off that subject, but I feel like it was, you know, the best thing that I ever did was volunteering and being freed from the thing that was holding me captive. Well, uh, what do, we, do either of you have anything to say to listeners who might be therapists and saying, I, I wonder if this is all hokum, uh, with that, that's uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and half of Sunday. That's, that's a lot of time, and I don't know if I should invest all of this time in, in this program. What would, you, what would you say to them? Well, I would say it's it's worth every penny on so many levels. One, because they get to work with, I don't know if Rhonda, they get to work with you. Yes. So you get to work with these three very skilled therapists that, you know, you can learn so much from in terms of professional development, but in terms of personal growth, you'll be working on yourself all weekend with all kinds of practice exercises and, and it will, it's, it's a, it's a good investment and it will probably change your life on, on some level. And if you volunteer, it will really change your life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks. <Get your> tickets. <laughs> I definitely agree with what Karen's saying. And it's amazing to actually be there and to witness like the flow of a team therapy session, you know, from start to finish, you know, T-E-A-M, right? And then, um, you know, seeing the results and the life-changing results is um, remarkable. Definitely do it. Yeah, that's my and, advice. And if I want to learn more about this, how should I go about it, Jill? <laughs> Let's just like say go online and read the details and yeah, the fine print and everything. Absolutely. Oh. So you should go to www.cbtintensive.com. So we call these long workshops that take place over many days, intensive therapist trainings. Right. So. Um, the website again is cbtintensive.com. And also just to let people know that um, the workshop is going to be in person, right? Like live in person with David and me and Rhonda and some other um, awesome helpers mm -hmm. um, in South San Francisco from August 8th to 11th. Um, and also we are live streaming it. So if therapists live somewhere where they're not able to come in to San Francisco or can't afford to come into San Francisco and attend live and kind of be a part of that whole live experience. We are live streaming it. Um, so you can register for either the in-person version or the live streamed person. And also it's um, continuing education approved for most therapist license types. So it's actually 30 hours of training and 30 CE credits. Um, so you can check off a lot of boxes. Yeah. And in past years, we've had a, a good number of people who have attended our Sa South San Francisco intensive from India, from England, from from all over the world. And yeah. now you can save yourself all the, the cost and the hours of travel and just uh, have the intensive experience from the convenience of your home and computer or cell phone or any any way you want to do it. And we will have helpers also, just like when you and I give uh, one-day workshops, Jill, we always have tons of helpers for the, the small groups, for the online folks as, as well. So this will be, be the same as that. So that's CBT Intensive. That's one word, cbtintensive.com. And uh, Jackie and and Karen, uh, just just so meaningful uh, today to 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 bring you both back and to say it really did happen. It's not just some demented memory of David who confabulates half of the time, but something <laughs> real and and emotional and 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 just just fantastic. Uh, Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Great to see everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast. For more information, 
visit Dr. Burns' website at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, the director of the Feeling Great Therapy Center. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.